tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A lot of help just to keep the firefighters rested, fed, hydrated. Watching the flames and the scramble to help how communities are banding together. When you run these small ERs right to the bone, you make them fail. Healthcare crunched again with another temporary ER closure in rural BC. Plus, <laughs> it's based on the true stories of BC's Punjabi immigrants, how a new film showcases the province and hits home for many. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. We begin tonight with the Karameas fire. We're just learning 150 more properties have been ordered to evacuate. The fire has more than doubled in size overnight and the scramble is on to do anything to lend a helping hand. Benit Braich is looking at the blaze, one of six of note burning in B.C. Crown fire consumes trees in the South Okanagan. Before a wall of smoke, helicopters drop buckets of water to slow the fire front. This blaze is still out of control. The fire cooperates and it changes its mind. It's very temperamental. Since yesterday, the Karameas Creek fire increased by more than 50% to over 42 square kilometers. This hillside is scarred with scorched ground left over from crews fighting fire with fire. They burn back essentially, you know, to the main body of the fire and that gives us a long what we call a big black line and that you know once you have a black line like that there's no more fuel and uh, the fire can't advance others like louis mckay doing anything they can to protect the land and people like installing these sprinklers to keep the land damp crews are also knocking on doors warning residents to leave but we remind them that their homes are replaceable but they're not Seven fires of note are now burning in the province, but officials warn more fires could spark with drier weather on the way. Officials say most fires this season have been started by lightning, the rest by people. Today, campfire bans take effect in southern B.C., and they are encouraging residents to be prepared. We're also asking residents to prepare yourselves, your family, home and community for any potential fires, follow all fire bans and avoid any activity that may result in a wildfire. Here at the wildfire, you can see the road is closed off. Emergency vehicles are coming through. It's smoky. It's really ashy. Today, the province is looking ahead at the rest of the season. Warmer, drier conditions are expected in August and September, as well as more wildfires. Benit Braich, CBC News, near Karameas. Now, in total, there have been more than 520 wildfires in B.C. this year, and more than 100 of those sparked in the last week and a half. Let's look at the other five wildfires of note burning right now. The Nahoman Creek is the next largest blaze. It's northwest of Lytton, about 31 square kilometers in size. The Briggs Creek Fire west of Caslow is burning in steep terrain at more than 16 square kilometers in size. There's also the Connell Ridge Wildfire just south of Cranbrook, the Maria Creek blaze northeast of Lillooet, and the Watching Fire near Kamloops. Well, in an effort to prevent more wildfires, today the province introduced a campfire ban for southern B.C. There are some questions about why a ban has taken so long, but the government says it follows advice from experts. We still had uh, almost 25% of our fires caused by uh, human cause as opposed to lightning. 75% are lightning and about there's about 6% that we're not sure of. But uh, so people have been pretty cautious and, and we thank them on that. But we leave it up to the professionals to determine when they should bring in uh, campfire bans. And um, they've decided that we should now bring one in for the south. And, and we're hoping everybody will make sure they take that very seriously. With that, Johanna Wagstaff is back. And Joe, some say fires are expected uh, to be coming in the coming weeks, more fires. Mm -hmm. I know you're tracking this closely. What are you seeing? Yeah, you're right, Anita. We are looking at another hot, dry ridge of high pressure to move in for the weekend into early next week. But first, we have to get through the thunderstorm risk tonight. I want to take you back to a video out of Kamloops from earlier today where we did see thunderstorms uh, that produced lightning. So a double-edged sword, anytime we get these low pressure systems move through, temperatures dropped over 10 degrees in the past couple of days for the southern interior, but it brought gusty winds, 
and lightning strikes. And while that does dramatically drop fire danger, we are worried about new fire strikes and those erratic winds uh, making for erratic fire conditions, as we heard uh, just earlier in the show. So here's the current situation. That low pressure system is tracking across the province. That's the same one that brought the steady rain to Vancouver last night the thunderstorms to Kamloops, and the thunderstorm risk to the Kootenays tonight. You can see right now that live lightning detector tracking all of those sparks through the Kootenays where fire danger is extreme right now. Now it is coming with some showers and cooler temperatures, but to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if we wake up tomorrow with several new fires uh, that we'll be watching in the Kootenays area because of how extreme fire danger is. But also note how those cooler temperatures really drop that risk. You know, huge swaths now in green, which is the low. That means uh, new fires won't spread as quickly. So again, a double-edged sword tonight. But Anita, as we head into the weekend, it's the hot and dry we'll be worried about. And it's likely that we will see heat warnings once again. So I'll break down those temperatures and talk about just how long this next heat wave will last coming up. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. You're welcome. representing 911 call takers in BC says staff shortages are leading to long wait times for callers. Back when I started, five to 10 second wait times were an emergency situation. We would drop everything to go plug in right away in order to be able to answer those calls immediately. Now we're regularly seeing those calls reach up to five minutes. Um, that's completely unacceptable. And what the funding formula is, is that uh, it's a reactive funding formula that isn't able to keep up with demands. Last year, we saw call volumes increase over 20%, and just the, the funding isn't keeping up with uh, making sure that there's enough people in the seats to answer the calls. Grant Based says the service is me, underfunded, is leading to a lack of employees. Last year, a report found an 80% bump in staffing was needed to meet operational demands. A significant number of staff is currently on leave due to occupational stress injuries. Grant says a more competitive wage package is needed to retain and hire more staff. Well, another hospital closure in a rural part of B.C. Clearwater's emergency room is set to close every evening until Sunday, leaving a big area without care. Yasmin Gandam has more on how this latest closure is affecting the community. We are playing Russian roulette with people's health right now. For those needing emergency medical care in Clearwater, the closest hospital is in Kamloops, over an hour away. The mayor of Clearwater says he is absolutely terrified that someone could die as a result of not being able to access an emergency room. It's already happened in Ashcroft uh, with a, with a death there. Blackwell says there are enough staff to fill the open spots, but many are leaving due to toxic work environments and fatigue from being overworked. It's about making them feel welcome um, and part of our communities. And it's about getting rid of toxic workplace environments and situations in our hospitals to make sure that the people that are there right now are happy and want to stay. Yellowhead Community Services Society in Clearwater provides support services for families and seniors in the region. The society says there is an overwhelming sense of anxiety in the community right now. From parents with small children or babies that um, you know may need to seek emergency uh, medical attention to seniors and those um, you know with compromised immune systems or other health issues. The ER closures are not just affecting Clearwater, but other rural communities in B.C. But Clearwater has had the most, with 33 closures to date. The B.C. Rural Health Network says staff shortages are universal across the province, even in urban centres, but affects those in rural regions the most. When you lose that service, you put people's lives in jeopardy, and uh, you especially put vulnerable people's lives in jeopardy who don't have the money for transportation or Adam says more support is needed to ensure rural communities like Clearwater don't get to that point. The Clearwater Overnight ER will reopen on Sunday at 6 p.m. after being closed for five days. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. A retired teacher in North Vancouver has been arrested with allegations of indecent assault reaching back to the 70s and 80s. The incidents took place at Upper Lynn Valley Elementary starting in 1970. The name of the former teacher, now 82 years of age, has not been released. He left the school in 1982, but police think assaults continued even after he left. Investigators searched the man's home after his arrest and are now asking for potential victims to come forward.
our officers, uh, investigators also conducted a, a search warrant, executed a search warrant at the residence. Um, you know, our investigation is still in the early stages. We're still gathering evidence. We know that there are more victims out there. And one of the things that we're doing today is asking those people to come forward. RCMP are providing support through their crisis intervention unit. You can reach them 24-7 at 604-969-7540. Well, a concerning video out of a Burnaby hockey rink is making the rounds online. It shows one player appearing to kick another player with a skate blade during a brawl. Now, this happened Friday night among the Adult Safe Hockey League at the Burnaby 8 rinks, Scotiabarn. You can see the player pile on getting rowdy, and one player's foot looks to have hit another player's face. Burnaby police were called to investigate the following Tuesday. They tell CBC the complainant sustained injuries, but it's not clear how bad. ASHL has issued a statement saying the offending player has been suspended indefinitely. A gathering to grieve the two men killed in a shooting spree in Langley saw dozens of people turn up. Advocates and family confirmed the victims were all members of the Langley homeless community. And as Liam Britton reports, people are now demanding more protections for those who are vulnerable. Officials held a vigil here to mourn those killed and wounded and offer their support for a community still reeling from the rampage. The question on everybody's mind is why? Why? Our community is mourning right now and we've had this tragic incident happen and we need to talk about it. We need to come together as a community and show our support. On July 25th, a six hour shooting spree killed two men, 60 year old Paul David Wynn and 43 year old Stephen Furness. A woman also suffered critical injuries. Another man was shot and survived. Police later shot and killed the alleged gunman. Near the vigil were several people who know homelessness firsthand. Lisa Tarika has been homeless on and off for 25 years, six or seven in Langley. There absolutely has to be more social housing for, for homeless people. Um, I mean, they can build a million condos around here for $500,000 to a million dollars each, but they can't, they can't build a whole building for, for homelessness. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Lisa Goddard has been precariously housed for two years. She was shocked by the rampage, but says people in her world face early, tragic deaths constantly. Like, I remember a time in my life when I would hear of somebody passing away, and it would, it, it was like stab wounds to the heart. You know, it was like, <gasps> it was such a huge ordeal, and it still is. I'm not taking away from, you know, the agony and the heart that people endure when losing somebody, but it's so common now, it's every day. Like, every, it seems like every single day, it's somebody dying. Kim Snow is a longtime advocate for people who are homeless. She wants to know what politicians will do to keep homeless people safe. It's heartbreaking and honestly I'm frustrated, I'm sad, I'm angry. I just want people to listen and make a difference, like do something about it. She and others say it's going to take a lot of work to help make the homeless community less vulnerable. Liam Britton, CBC News, Langley. Well, a film that recently hit Canadian theatres traces the Punjabi community's roots in B.C. all the way back to the early 1900s. It showcases a preserved historical town in the Caribou Mountains. And as Josh Grant reports, the movie is based on the true stories of South Asian immigrants and what their lives were like when they first arrived in this province. Moviegoers in Surrey say Chala Mutke Nyaya, or Chala Never Came Home, is deeply relatable for BC's South Asian community, describing the film as both emotional and entertaining. What did you think of the movie? Yeah, the uh, movie was very fine. It was fantastic. The struggle of the Asian people in the 90s and 80s is really hard to see story. The story is about a Punjabi man from India who comes to Canada and works a grueling job in a sawmill to earn for his family. He meets other South Asian men who struggle with homesickness. They come together to build a community and push back against discrimination. For some, the movie gives perspective on their parents and grandparents' sacrifices. Showing us uh, how much hard work people have done before, right? Now sometimes I feel like our life is very hard here. No, no, no. It's very easy. It's very easy, actually. Sorry, I was crying inside. Most of the film is in Punjabi, and while a bit of it was shot in India, the majority was filmed in the historic town of Barkerville, east of Quinell, with a few scenes at the old McLean Mill near Port Alberni. So it was heartening to see that the research has been done and that the stories are true to the 
migration of uh, Punjabi Sikhs in D.C. in the early 1900s. Baines says it really highlights the push and pull experience of immigrating to a new country. You know, when they arrived here, what they faced and what uh, tugged their heart sleeves uh, back to home. The actor who plays Bella, an Italian immigrant and the main character Chala's love interest, says the movie sends a message that's still important today. We come from two different cultures, but both cult- finding the similarities between our cultures, both are so based in community and our village and music and laughter and dancing. And we're, as immigrants in Canada, able to find each other and bring home across the ocean when we come together, which is really beautiful. Chalamudke Nyaya is screening at Cineplex Theatres across BC. Josh Grant, CBC News, Vancouver. Yeah, definitely hits home for me. The movie highlights the fact that most Punjabi immigrants who came here at one time worked in the sawmill, something my grandfather also did and spoke a lot about. So I'll be sure to check out that film for sure. Okay, continuing with the film industry in BC, a TV show being filmed here has been shut down by a WorkSafe BC investigation over concerns about its extreme heat plan. Snowpiercer has been ordered to make a number of changes before it can restart. Multiple workers got sick on the Pit Meadows set of the TNT production because of exposure to heat on July 28th. Some of those workers needed to be treated in hospital. WorkSafe found a number of problems, including not accounting for long-sleeved costumes, failing to monitor and record heat and humidity every hour, and not identifying the most vulnerable workers. In an email to CBC, production company Tomorrow Studios confirmed the shoot was wrapped early out of an abundance of caution. Well, if you've ever had a close, safe encounter with a wild animal, you know it's been a memorable uh, moment, even if it was just for a short period of time. Now imagine a creature the size of a bus hanging around for an hour. We saw the whale and I stopped, probably a couple hundred meters away from it, and I saw it diving towards us. It turned, it was going opposite direction with us. It turned, dove down, and half a minute later it popped up right next to the boat. Oh my God. Alexander Benyak says he was out on the water with his family off the coast of Vancouver Island yesterday when they had the experience of a lifetime. Look at that, wow. They were whale watching and this humpback approached their boat. Now he admits they were scared, but says it wouldn't be smart to fire up the engine and leave lest he hurt the massive animal. Uh, Benyuk says as their nerves calmed down, they started trusting the creature, which rubbed against his boat and bent a railing with its fin. He says the humpback spent 60 minutes hovering around. Now, Fisheries and Oceans Canada says people need to stay at least 100 meters from most whales, dolphins, and porpoises. I suspect if you ask, you'll find out that the boat operator here uh, had his depth sounder on and the depth sounder is bouncing sound down to the bottom and back up to the boat. We use them to look for fish. We also use it to make sure we don't run into rocks. And I think we've got a case here where for the, for the humpback whale, this appears to be another living being that's almost its own size. Uh, it's something it can interact with and it can rub up against it, engage with it, not knowing that it really is not a living organism, but it's just something of its own size that it can engage with. Oh my God. The number of humpback whale sightings has increased in the last don't worry, don't few worry. years. However, coming in close contact with the humpback could, of course, be dangerous, according to experts. Well, Team BC came out swinging today in its opening game of the Canadian Little League Baseball Championship. Vancouver's Little Mountain Little League outran the Moose Jaw All-Stars 15-5. to Here's a peek of some of the action. Funny hop went through the legs, but... It's all about how you respond. That's a base hit for Boozmina. His fourth hit today cashes in you, and BC has got another run in this one. It's 14-5. Top of the order for BC has just been deadly. Team BC's next game is against Calgary on Saturday. You can catch the action live online at CBC Sports. Okay, the Abbotsford Air Show is set to launch tomorrow. There will be one notable absence, of course, the snowbirds withdrawing after a crash. There's still plenty to take in. And the CBC's Susanna De Silva joins us live from the airport tonight. Okay, Susie, I mean, 
I grew up down the street from the airport. The air show might be my favorite weekend of every year. Safe to say, I think you have the best assignment tonight. So uh, you got to tell us, how's that? Well, I have to say, Anita, I have come to a realization tonight, just actually in the short la last little while, I've missed my true calling. The CF-18s <laughs> just came by and they practiced. They were amazing. That is what I should be doing here on this Friday night is flying one of those. I am not. I'm here talking to you. That's still a good thing. They came by. They are practicing tonight. They are practicing a number of aircraft. There's actually some families and kids from Ronald McDonald House who are here tonight taking in all of the amazing activities that they have going on. And I want to get out of the way right now because you can see the practice that's happening right now. We have the Ace Makers T-33, a retired Air Force pilot, is in there making the rounds to impress the crowds that are here right now. And that is some of what is going on this weekend. As you mentioned, of course, the snowbirds are not here this weekend because of that crash. And there is an ongoing investigation into that hard landing because of that. But there are lots of other things still happening here this weekend. We have the Skyhawks demonstration demonstration parachuters will be jumping. I was hopefully going to be able to go out with them this afternoon. The weather didn't quite cooperate. We're, I'm still hoping that's on the horizon. Uh, but of course, the U.S. Air Force has their Thunderbirds out here this weekend as well. Uh, so there is still a lot to take in. Again, those CF-18s will be flying all weekend for people to take in. And also part of what it will be, and, and to sort of juggle what has happened with the Snowbirds not being able to be here, is helping people appreciate how busy the airports are. Uh, not only will they be dealing with the practice and the stunt planes and the various things uh, but of course, regular air traffic that happens here. And we had a chance to speak with the air boss. And yes, that is his title, air boss. And he described a little bit of what it's like to manage all of that. This is a little like being the conductor for an orchestra. And you count on having several pieces and they each play their part on time. But sometimes I get some extra pieces, like when the water, water bombers need to do a water bomber scramble and get to a fire, or maybe they need to fly a part out to get to an airplane that is fighting a fire somewhere else in the province. Or an airline decides to come in, you know, an hour late or a half an hour late. You got people not playing their parts on time and somehow you still have to make the show work. And of course, he talks about having several planes in the air, several planes about to take off, some about to land and trying to juggle all that. And they will be talking to the people here about what it is that's going on, these other operations, the forestry, the firefighting crews, if they're needing to go to help people appreciate along with all of this that they've had here. It is the 60th anniversary of the air show. It will be the first time that the snowbirds don't make an appearance, but there will be a lot to take in. And uh, I will see if it's not too late for me to fly a CF-18 someday. Anita? Take me with you, Susie. Take me with you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a release that's meant to warn citizens to stay away. But of the 11 people identified by police as exceptionally dangerous, nine of them are Punjabi. We go into that next. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, descendants of Canadian soldiers who helped to liberate the Netherlands in World War II are honoring their bravery in a unique way. They're taking a pilgrimage to walk in their father's footsteps. Take a look. This is a picture of my dad when he was serving. Uh, in her photo albums, Maureen Livenook doesn't have many pictures of her father from the war. It's something he never really talked much about besides a few stories. Corporal Peter Schant was a 27-year-old soldier when he was nearly killed in Antwerp, Belgium in 1944 after a bomb went off. He talks about the, the carnage around him and a little girl who passed away. And it was, uh, I think, his defining moment of the war. Now she's getting ready to go on a 12-day pilgrimage called In Her Father's Footsteps to visit the spot her father almost lost his life. The group will travel to a number of meaningful places across the Netherlands from the war. 100 Canadian descendants, 11 from Alberta, will make the 60-kilometer trek, ending with a ceremony at a royal palace in the centre of the country. Well, you can't really can't really understand what they went through unless you can walk the same path. Organizers say commemorations, vigils and celebrations with Dutch locals are planned on the journey, with some participants including personal plans of their own, like one Alberta woman visiting where her relative is buried. Uh, he was killed during the Second World War, is buried there, and she's always wanted to go uh, to, to place an Alberta flag on his grave. And so she will be the first in her family to go there and, and honor that relative. 
For Livinook, the trip comes with another personal mission to return some historic photos after more than 75 years. My dad had picked up a bunch of photographs when he was in Amsterdam. Uh, he was clearing a press office and he had photographs that he uh, picked up and brought home and I'm taking them back. The In Our Father's Footsteps pilgrimage takes place in September. Organizers say there are still spots open for anyone interested in taking part. Gabriella Panzabaltrandi, CBC News, Edmonton. To a story now we brought you yesterday, a warning from police. The agency tasked with investigating organized crime and gang conflict in B.C. issuing a public warning about 11 men with alleged gang connections. They say these men pose a safety risk to the public. When you look at that poster, nine out of 11 of those men are South Asian, particularly from the Punjabi community. I want to bring in Manpreet Sarai to talk more about this. Manpreet works in Abbotsford with kids vulnerable to being involved in organized crime and gangs. Manpreet, why is there such a big representation from one group here? I think we've seen a lot of gang violence in the last few weeks, which escalates as rivals seek revenge. The shootings have involved some South Asian individuals, and their associates are now at risk, which is reflected on that list. I'm not sure how closely that list represents BC's gang demographics. We know that it's hard to track gang demographics, and there are more established gangs with older members who tend to fly under the radar and don't get as much attention. So when it comes to how this might affect or harm the perception of young men of colour, is it fair for law enforcement to put out a poster like this? I think for public safety, it is important to put out a poster like that. But I also think it's important to remember that gang members that are represented on that list are a very small portion of the overall South Asian population. That being said, not only did one of India's national newspapers put out a story about this today, uh, I hear from people living in India all the time, people living in the UK, in the States, who ask about the gang scene here and the Punjabi connection. They know about it. How concerning is it to you that that is the reputation that's out there globally? I think it is embarrassing. We do hear about it. I hear it from friends and family also from all over North America about the BC gangs and how involved South Asians are in involved in it but it's been this has been for years now so and it keeps increasing so it's very important to educate our community and help them figure out what best ways it is to get our youth out of these gangs and what are some of those ways that you're talking to families about what needs to happen so we have some proven strategies that help interrupt the flow of young of young people into gangs Unfortunately, uh, be, due to funding, we also have our own wait list of 20 at-risk youth who are not able to get services yet because our staff have such a high caseload. I think it's so important that uh, the governments fund these programs and fund more prevention programs so that the youth that are not getting served get served. So what happens to those kids who actually do get the support? So we have youth that come to us um, and they start setting their goals with their youth worker. They start building that confidence to um, go out there, whether it's something small as getting their resume done, applying for university, getting a job. Once they start achieving those goals, 
They come back to us years later, so thankful for the program and the youth workers that supported them through their toughest times when their friends were supporting them, getting going into the negative, you know, gang lifestyle. Manpreet Sarai, thank you. Thank you. A suspect in a series of shootings has been killed by police in Montreal. More on what he was accused of coming up. Another government department took a big step into the age of automation today. The fisheries minister says he's decided to de-staff 18 lighthouses. Eve Savory reports. Don Graham first came as keeper to the Point Atkinson Lighthouse 19 years ago. Now he must go and Point Atkinson will lose its keeper forever. It's going to result in loss of lives, property, confidence, and Coast Guard to live up to its mandate of safety first and service always. 18 lighthouses will be de-staffed over the next year. Two in the Maritimes, eight in Newfoundland, and eight in British Columbia. That is the beginning. The remainder in more remote areas where the weather is worse will be automated when and if the technology proves itself. I take no joy in, in closing a lighthouse, but I've got to take my responsibility to deliver the services we need at a cost we can afford, given the, the, uh, the fiscal requirements of the day, seriously. It's a compromise of sorts. The original plan to automate all of the country's 70 remaining staffed lighthouses was greeted with fury in coastal communities. Last winter, there were public consultations in 28 different communities. This report into the hearings described the opposition there as widespread, often vehement, and overwhelming. The RCMP testified that lighthouse keepers spot drug smugglers. Boaters testified light keepers had saved their lives, like Ron Paradise, whose boat was holed and capsized. Without them, ultimately, we wouldn't be here. Are you sure? Oh, for sure. But almost every country in the world has automated. Today's changes will save almost $2 million a year. But the union calls that reason cold-hearted. It enjoys no support outside the bureaucrats who have made a career of trying to get rid of us. Now they seem on the threshold of success. Over the next year, remote monitoring equipment, replacement lights, and backup batteries will be installed in the lighthouses. And then their keepers will say goodbye. East Avery, CBC News, Vancouver. Police in Montreal say they have shot and killed a suspect accused of a series of seemingly random shootings, three within less than 48 hours, each leaving a man dead. As Shu Yi Lee reports, they tracked the suspect down to the suburbs of the city. The investigation by Montreal police led them to the Motel Pierre in Saint Laurent, where they confronted the suspect. Quebec's police watchdog, the BEI, says shots were fired and the 26-year-old man died after being struck at least once. Montreal police had a search warrant in relation to the three shootings that killed a 64-year-old man in Saint Laurent Tuesday night, a 48-year-old man in Hunsic Cartierville an hour later, and a man in his 20s in Laval last night. Meantime, provincial police are taking over the investigation into the three shootings in Montreal and Laval. 
The SQ says they have no motive for now, and it appears the suspect acted alone and had no links to the victims. From what we've known, he was not known to police as related to organized crime. Um, Montreal police answered a few calls for a mental health uh, related to this guy. So uh, we don't know for now, is it because of a mental illness? Is it because of another motivation? It's under investigation now. Guests at the motel got an unexpected wake-up call in the morning. I was in shock. Oh, I didn't hear nothing. That's why uh, I was uh, surprised this morning to see all the, the, the policemen. And I opened the TV and I uh, saw on, on TV, hey, that's my, the motel where I live. The shootings have shaken people living and working in the area. Malik Akhtar has operated the car wash next to the motel for the past four years. I uh, was not surprised because something happened always here and, uh, you know, until I don't ask to the police, uh, I, I was not sure that what happened. After hearing that someone was shot dead near a bus shelter in Saint Laurent, Daryl Holmes says he took an Uber to his overnight job instead of the usual bus. I work overnight, so I have to leave the house with knowing that people are doing that is extremely scary and worrisome, you know, because I take the bus. I'm a, just a regular guy. I didn't, the other guy that got shot, he was just a regular guy going to work. I'm just going to work. For Holmes, a lifelong Saint Laurent resident, the borough was always a safe place to live, but now he's not so sure. And now things like this that happen right in your area, it, uh, like I said, it, it makes you want to move. Montreal police say they found the suspect quickly thanks to its investigative team and the information it gathered over the past 24 hours. Xu Yili, CBC News, Montreal. American conspiracy theorist Alex Jones has been ordered to pay $4 million to the parents of one of the kids killed in the Sandy Hook school shooting. Jones had falsely claimed the 2012 massacre was a hoax. The verdict comes at the end of a two-week trial. The jurors will also consider a request for as much as $75 million in punitive damages for spreading falsehoods about the killings. 20 children and six staff were shot to death at an ele elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut. The parents who brought the lawsuit say they received death threats from Jones's followers. Well, American basketball star Brittany Griner has been found guilty of drug smuggling and possession in Russia. She's been sentenced to nine years. Griner and her lawyers had asked for leniency. They argued that she had not acted with intent, that she had accidentally brought her prescription cannabis with her to Russia. The court disagreed, calling it a deliberate crime. U.S. President Joe Biden is calling the verdict unacceptable. And officials say Washington is working to have Griner and another American brought home. There are reports the Americans are offering a convicted arms dealer in a prisoner exchange. Moscow is not saying whether it's open to a swap. Well, the Canadian military is going to resume training Ukrainian forces later this month. We are fulfilling our promise to resume large-scale training under Operation Unifier. I have authorized the deployment of up to 225 Canadian Armed Forces personnel to the United Kingdom, where they will train new Ukrainian military recruits. Members of the Canadian military will be delivering the training in the UK for at least four months. They'll be working with counterparts from Britain, the Netherlands and New Zealand. Canada's initial training mission in Ukraine was suspended just before the Russian invasion in February. A restaurant in PEI has faced an employee crunch, but their chef has a novel solution to the problem. Ditch the tips. Why that might just work next. At 6.37, you're looking at a live shot of Kamloops tonight, where the skies are clearing after a cool and stormy day. Much needed rain, but also some threatening lightning. Johanna has the full forecast coming up.
Well, restaurants on Prince Edward Island, like in many places, are facing a problem familiar to restaurants here in B.C. Not enough workers. So, of course, the challenge has become attraction and retention. Well, one island chef has come up with a novel suggestion. Get rid of tipping. Steve Bruce explains. It's probably a safe bet that just about every one of these customers dining out in downtown Charlottetown will tip their server at the end of their meal at least 15%. Like if it was really terrible, we would still tip. If it was really extraordinary, we would tip more. Uh, I find personally that it's important to give better tip than in the past. So I'm always going to 20 to 25 person all the time now. Tipping at restaurants is just standard practice in Canada. Here at Gaia's Urban Eatery, those tips are pooled and dished out equally to all servers and kitchen staff. Server Hallie Quinn says she depends on her tips to get by. $14 an hour is what I make, and then in tips, I don't know, it ranges from like $80 on a good day to probably more on a very good day. As a server, I think we do rely on it a lot. Okay. <laughs> but island chef Michael Smith says it's time for tipping to go away. He and his partner own the Inn at Bay Fortune and run its high-end restaurant. They have a no-tipping policy here and instead just charge more for their food, which they pass on to all their staff through higher wages and benefits. Smith thinks other restaurants, many of which are struggling to find enough workers right now, would be wise to do the same. doesn't work. We need to pay everybody fairly. And tipping does not correlate with service. It only ever correlates with sexism, with misogynism, with racism. It's not a fair system. Everybody deserves to be fairly paid, transparently, not wondering and dancing this ridiculous thing that we only do in North America with the tip. The industry association Restaurants Canada says Smith's no tipping approach is becoming a bit more common across the country, though it's still rare. It's a part of our culture. Hard for, it's hard to get people to, to change their behavior and people are used to having the option, customers are used to having the option to, uh, to determine the value of the tip. And uh, so some other uh, restaurateurs may not be as, as uh, open to it. Gaia's owner has no desire to get away from tipping. He says his staff appreciate being rewarded for good service and he worries higher menu prices would drive customers away. You're making the customer pay more money because you want to compensate your employee more. As a customer, you didn't give me a choice. We're not in Japan. I'm, I, I, can't, I can't see that happening, to be honest. Hallie Quinn, for one, says she would support dropping tipping and bumping up her wages. That's as long as it didn't add up to less money in her pocket than she's making right now. If I knew that I was going to get paid just as much and I had like that, I had that comfort in knowing, I think I'd be okay with that. Steve Bruce, CBC News, Charlottetown. At the beginning of the show, we were just learning of a new evacuation order because of that Karameas fire. 150 more properties told to pack up. Well, it's actually an entire community. Olala is on Highway 3A. It's about an eight-minute drive up the road from Karameas, where parts of that town are now on alert as well. They've been told to get ready to leave at a moment's notice. So let's bring in Johanna Wagstaff now to talk more about this. Joe, how close are we getting? Uh, let me show you on a map, Anita. I've just put on uh, Olala, just north of Karameas. It's almost in the outskirts, but it is a, a separate uh, settlement. And as you said, just eight minutes up the road, it's starting to get very close to the fire that has made a run down towards the outskirts. Winds are coming in from the north, pushing that fire towards the south. And this is where the fire has really doubled through the overnight with those northerly winds. And that's all thanks to the passage of the cold cold front associated with this low pressure. Now, a cold front sounds like good news, cooler temperatures, some showers, but those gusty winds have really been uh, the, the bad part of the story today, gusting to about 40 kilometers per hour uh, right now. And it may be some time, a few hours, before we see those winds really calm down. But again, winds coming in from the north at about 40 kilometers per hour right now, and that's pushing those fires farther to the south 
which is why we're seeing those new evacuation orders. Current temperatures are much cooler. Ashcross 17, Lytton 15, uh, Oliver in the Carameas area, probably down around those mid to high teens as well. And that does really help the situation. You know, a few days ago when we were in the 40s, uh, a lot of the water was just evaporating before it hit the ground, which is why the prescribed burns was the better option when it comes to uh, fighting the fires. Temperatures are going to rise again, and that's going to be our next story really starting this weekend. We'll hit the 30s again. 30 is sort of our baseline for explosive fire weather. Sunday, mid-30s, and unfortunately, we'll get back to the high 30s for Monday into Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So about a four-day stretch. Here's Vancouver's forecast. But that'll translate to about 10 degrees warm in the interior. So Saturday uh, to sort of Wednesday is that explosive fire weather condition in the interior. Now, tomorrow for Vancouver, just the slightest chance of a shower in the morning. It's still comfortable and seasonal. We'll feel that heat build for the weekend. And Anita, really, again, Sunday to Tuesday, when we might see those heat warnings for us and for the interior before we get that cool down. But at least... This is not going to be as long as uh, the heat dome we had last week. Okay, that is good news for sure. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, the early days of the pandemic had a lot of people trying a lot harder to get outdoors and to stay active. So many of those people took up cycling. And as Madeleine Cummings reports, unfortunately, that appears to have led to a spike in cycling injuries. Two years ago, Brent Bush's early morning bike ride came to a screeching halt. I saw the vehicle coming, I braced for impact and boom, uh, went over the handlebars, went face first into the ground and uh, uh, my face got a little injured in my uh, hand. The North Edmonton resident knows he was lucky and admits he was partly to blame because he was entering the street from the sidewalk. I was driven to the hospital. Uh, in all the serious in injuries, it was very minor. I did have to give stitches on my thumb. And I don't recall if I got stitches on my face. I just looked a little beat up. And that was about it. And uh, once I was released from the hospital, I went out and bought a helmet. Bush is one of thousands of Canadians who was injured on a bike during the first year of the pandemic. According to data from the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the number of cycling-related hospitalizations increased by 25% during that time period. We know during the time that um, traditional leisure activities were not necessarily available to everyone um, due to public health measures, people still wanted to spend time outside and they may have tried new activities like cycling that they may not have necessarily tried in the past. Go for the side lenses, good, and stay there. This physiotherapy clinic saw a rush of injured cyclists starting in July of 2020. In the last two years especially, um, I saw quite a bit more than what I usually do. Um, I've been practicing for 24 years. I would say 2020, 2021, I saw more cycling injuries for sure. Giri Srinivasan says injuries are still above pre-pandemic levels because beginner cyclists have been taking more risks. His advice for staying safe in the saddle? Make sure you have the proper equipment, helmets, right bikes, right heights, and right shoes and right protection devices. Number two, make sure your body is ready for it. Make sure your movement signature and your balance signature is there for you to do that sport. Srinivasan says most cycling injuries were linked to falls, with people injuring their necks, backs, and shoulders. He says there is good news. Most of the cases are mild, like bushes, and cyclists quickly recover. Madeline Cummings, CBC News, Edmonton. Another big change since the start of the pandemic, the rise of e-bikes and e-scooters. While they are very popular, not everyone is happy to see them on bike paths. As Alex Leduc reports, Quebec says it's ready to take another look at the rules in order to keep everyone safe and happy. A bike path used to be somewhere you'd just see cyclists pedaling along. Nowadays, it's a festival of gadgetry as people explore new ways to get around. Some vehicles are allowed here, but some others are not, and it's making some Montrealers uncomfortable. You feel that somebody's going to run into you at some point. It's, it's, yeah, it doesn't feel safe. It is a little scary, especially on a narrow bike path like this where they're passing us. Of particular concern, these types of electric scooters seen more and more on bike paths, although this delivery driver says he tries to stay on the road. I feel like this shouldn't be allowed on the bike path because... This is like a heavy speed bike. But Vora says he was told they are allowed because they have these non-functioning pedals, which technically make them close enough to a bike. 
This new edition, Justin Bieber edition. Jean-François Papineau sells Vespas and other motorized bikes. He says customers often ask about using bike paths. Uh, they ask us if they can drive it over there, but uh, it has a plate. You need to have an helmet, so it's a street vehicle. Even during an interview, you can see the driver of an electric scooter run a red light and continue on using a bike path. Like the one I just saw behind me, they're not allowed. A bike path is for bicycles that are um, uh, only, and uh, we can also have electric bicycles. And that is where the province is looking at changing its laws, given the growing popularity and strength of e-bikes. It's something Jean-François Roux of Vélo Québec has been pushing for. We see a lot of vehicles that, are, that should not be on bike path. Transport Quebec says the government is also looking at what to do about stand-up electric scooters, with a pilot project already launched. Currently, they're illegal anywhere except private property. Of course, they're seen plenty in public, and the province says that and any other vehicles illegally rolling down bike paths are a matter for law enforcement. Alex Leduc, CBC News, Montreal. It is worth noting, e-scooters are legal here in British Columbia, and they are allowed on local streets as well as protected cycle lanes. Now, there are a number of rules, though. Brakes, lights, those are required, and users must wear a helmet and be older than 16. A town in Labrador has a big problem, or a small problem, depending on how you look at it. Too many cats taking on too many kittens. That's next. for being here with us. Thank you. So I know you are like a model, a dancer, a masquerader, and you're an author as well. You brought your new, your book. Can you tell us about it? It's about my carnival experience. And is the character you in the book? Yeah, this is me. And what does she do in the book? I dance my costume and I have lots and lots of fun. And I have so much fun, I, and I win a trophy. And when I dance, I'm a little bit scared. Right, just like a little nervous, right? Thank you guys so much for being here with us and sharing your book with us. Thank you for having me. Yes, I cannot wait to read your book. Looks amazing. At the Ukraine Pavilion this year, children took to the stage to share a presentation in their native tongue. Bystanders looked on, some made sure to make a stop. First thing I wanted to do was go to the Ukrainian Pavilion. Out of respect for them, what those poor Russians are doing to the nice Ukrainians was awful. And I wanted to have some pierogies and taste their culture and be part of that whole dynamic. Volunteers say celebrating their Ukrainian culture amid the war is important to ensure it stays alive. Russian invaders, they want to eliminate our culture. They want to eliminate Ukrainian, Ukrainians as a nation. They don't want to have and see the Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language, Ukrainian history. We have the thousand years history. And that was on full display in Horlick Park, including information about the ongoing war and Ukraine's fight against Russia. The pavilion had organizers looking to the future with hope as more children spent the day performing in Ukrainian. They keep in their hearts and their uh, parents and they, they keep the Ukrainian culture and tradition in their hearts. And then we'll be, when we, they will grow, they will be the proud Canadian citizens, but they also will be proud Ukrainians. Some of those who came out are newcomers to Canada. Volunteers say newly immigrated Ukrainians can find a community at their booth. Make some new friends here. Uh, they can, you know, try English because many people, they're just like newcomers. They need to practice English, all of this stuff. The Heritage Festival runs until Monday, featuring the sights, sounds and tastes from 60 communities and cultures across 50 other outdoor pavilions. Gabriella Panza-Baltrandi, CBC News, Edmonton.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Cinematech with Stephen Quinn at a gala on August 19th. Enjoy prize draws, culinary delights, and more. Get tickets today at thecinematech.ca and never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. A new thrift store has opened up in Labrador and it has a very specific purpose. Mission Kitty is on a mission to help control the province's cat population. Take a look. You are in Mission Kitty thrift shop. Uh, this was something I've been working on for quite some time. Uh, took about maybe a year to, to, get it, to make it happen and um, I'm extremely happy about how the first month has gone. Uh, the thrift store is something that uh, Wabash and Lab City really needed here. We haven't had one in, a, in several years. Um, and I thought with the way things are going and uh, the rising costs of everything, that uh, a thrift store would go really good. So, uh, you know, we take all the unwanted items that people have and sell it at a discounted price. And the profit goes to the kitties. So everybody wins. Um, Mission Kitty is a group that I started about five years ago this fall. I um, started really small scale when I lost my cat, and I've told this story before, but uh, my sweet angel jingles, it was something I did for him when I found out uh, we couldn't get cats in Labrador. It was really hard, and I went to Newfoundland, and they have a really bad problem with cats got together with some of the rescue groups out there to figure out what I could do from Labrador to help them. Um, we, we get a lot of different reactions when people come in. Um, it is a thrift store and I feel like thrift store typically means clothing, but um, on top of all the clothing, there's a little bit of everything. Oh my goodness, I think, first of all, I think it's a wonderful project. We come here almost every day and support the kitties, don't we? And we buy toys, and it's just beautifully set up. Leah, do you have a kitty or do you have a pet? I have two kittens. Nice. And what are their names? Navi and Nova. With inflation now, and they've got such great quality of donations that I find the clothing really, really affordable, and I find some great bargains. I picked up a couple of tops. Plus, it's going to a good cause, so that's always a plus. Uh, this weekend coming up, in a couple of days, my sister and I are traveling to Belle Island. Um, there's a big cat project going on there starting on Saturday. A team from Ontario, a vet and, and their team, are coming to Belle Island and they're going to spay and neuter 300 cats in four days. So Belle Island has a big problem with um, stray, wild, feral cats and they're going to come down and together we're all going to try and uh, fix that problem a little anyway. Business is probably doing pretty well right now. Thrift stores, consignment, both things that are growing hugely in popularity at the moment. That is CBC Vancouver News at 6 on this Thursday night. Thanks for watching and we'll see you here tomorrow.